Hello, everyone. Welcome to our virtual poetry night. I'm Nicole, the manager at Read It Again Bookstore, and I'm joined tonight by Rebecca Aronson and Aaron Adair Hodges, um, two poets, one from New Mexico and one who's currently in Texas. Um, but you're also from New Mexico, right, Aaron? Yes. That's right. Um, so tonight uh, we're going to have each of the poets will read for 15 minutes from their work and then uh, we'll, they'll have a discussion on craft. You'll be welcome to ask any questions. You can make any comments throughout and we'll respond to them as we see them. Um, the uh, Rebecca's book just came out two days ago, uh, Anchor, is her newest collection. And Erin has a book coming out in February, I believe. So if anybody wants either of those, Rebecca, uh, Anchor is currently available at the bookstore and Erin's we can pre-order for you. Um, so first of all, we're going to have a, um, a reading, first from Erin and then from Rebecca. Meanwhile, Bryn, Bryn Gribben says hi. Um, hi. <laughs> Um, so Aaron's going to start us off with 15 minutes of poetry, uh, so I will introduce her. Erin Adair Hodges is the author of Let's All Die Happy, winner of the Agnes Lynch Sarit Poetry Prize and Every Form of Ruin, forthcoming in 2023. That's the one coming out in February. A recipient of the Swanee Review's Alan Tate Prize and the Lorraine Williams Prize from the Georgia Review, her work has been featured in such places as PBS NewsHour, American Poetry Review, Kenyon Review, Plowshares, Prairie Schooner, The Rumpus, and more. Born and raised in New Mexico, she now lives in Kansas City and is a fiction acquisitions editor at Lake Union Publishing. All right, Erin, take it away. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks to everyone at Read It Again. And of course, thank you to uh, Rebecca Aronson, who, um, and she and I will probably talk about this after the reading as we have a conversation, but um, was incredibly instrumental in me ever sending my work out and shaping it into a first book. So um, the reason I'm in Texas actually will connect to some of the themes of this reading is I'm out here to help my elderly father and his wife. And so I am in a rural Texas county, um, staying in a hotel room. So apologize the hotel uh, lamp behind me. And I'm gonna read a, a poem for my first book that is actually about an experience in this same county about six years ago. And uh, it's from this first book, Let's All Die Happy. So um, in a lot of parts of like, you know, central rural America, there are still dry counties where they don't serve alcohol. And so this is in a dry county. The restaurant sells beer, but you have to be in a club. How do I get in the club? I ask. You have to tell me you want to be in the club, she says. Okay, I say, yes. You have to say it, she says. It is like we are getting married or I'm giving her a Miranda warning. I want to be in the club, okay? Now what, how much? It's free, you're in the club. Okay, but how do I get out? You can't get out, it's for always. You are always in this club. But what if I never come back? My father is very old and he's why I'm here and I am trying to bring him back to New Mexico to live as long as he can live. She is so young, she thinks people only die in car accidents. It's okay, she whispers. You're still in the club. Um, I'm going to read now from um, some poems from the new book, which is a sort of loose retelling of Aeschylus's Oresteia in that, the, the three play trilogy, in that it's interested in the furies and women's anger and a lot of the ways in which we are required to sublimate and transform that anger uh, for the comfort of others. At least that, you know, through my lived experience. Um, so yeah, <laughs> so the first one is that opening poem from that book, Black Thumb. The dogwood was threatening to swallow the back garden's light. So I borrowed a chainsaw and gas. Its last buries a memory of red, the fruit bitter, tiny, angry mangoes in the mouth of its killer. Nights, my son chooses his father to read him into silence. I practice not loving anything, less like learning than remembering. As a child, I studied how to be a child. I was given a doll to care for, but could never remember its name. I left her face down everywhere. She had her father's eyes. 
Each morning she greeted me with a blankness I chose to know as forgiveness. There, there, I said and slapped her back. There, there, I say to the tree trunk, its pale O's of accusal. From his bedroom window, my son eyes me, holding the humming saw. What I look like to him is a memory only he is born to bear. Um, I'm going to read a couple poems about work um, for a lot of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is I think just simply that Rebecca and I met working together. We taught together at Central New Mexico Community College, um, hired full time at the same time, 20 cl class of 2010. Um, and then we began collaborating, writing together. We started reading series together, Bad Mouth. Um, but for me, and I think for well, a lot of people there, as I age, I find this increasing difficulty, um, the expectations that I segment um, the events of my personal life in order to perform at work. Because of course, it's also that as you age, the, um, the, the things that are happening in your life get more and more, um, the stakes are raised and become sort of harder to, to create that work self that is, some, you know, that is performance. So I have a couple of uh, worky poems. And I just lost it one second. This is called, I have cried off all of my makeup on a Tuesday. The marching band sweating on the dry grass below the clock tower disgorges its spit valves, primes the batons for maximum sincerity. I huddle behind my office door in the dark. In the hallway, Margot is looking for a stapler. She knocks on all the doors. She cannot be satisfied, and for the first time, I understand her, her wiglet askew, eyeliner cracked up in crow's feet. Margot doesn't want your mini stapler, your tot stapler, your pocket stapler, Jeff. She needs security, has worked too hard for it all to fall apart. I hold my CV as proof I am real. It's true I am not exactly living in my car, but it is also true I am not exactly living anywhere else. I've forgotten what's in the boxes I markered with my name and what could need me, bring me to need what's inside. I spirit into the swank and seedy, a diplomat brokering accords with desire. Men have trouble guessing my age, which makes it hard for them to know in which way to dismiss me. Each twilight, I pull out a map to sleep, drive down truant streets and kids with night in their eyes. Me, a mouth in search of words. Toledo's teeth of glass and wood. Without mountains, I don't know where I am and wind to the river, ask its banks what they are hungry for. Is it me? Is it my children? Is this where my own have gone? I'm forgetting if I remembered to make them. I am beloved, and only the river knows my name. My head is underwater. On the banks, children wave. Their parents shout, good luck. Um, part of that is about how I left New Mexico to take a visiting job in the Midwest, which is a frankly insane thing to do, but uh, has led to good places. Um, this one is about a place I no longer work, so it's okay, and therefore I could share it with you. Uh, it's titled, My New Boss Has Been Thinking a Lot About Time. Though he doesn't say exactly what this thinking is about. He strokes his beard, a clock his face has made. His right leg lifted to harass the chair, his left on the floor, pulpited flamingo in tweed. He tells me to relax. And maybe it's because of the authoritative way he can grow hair under his nose, but this command works like a cauldron incantation. I'm so relaxed. It's as if I have never too thought about time, about the frenzied hours trying to settle my son's dervishing, begging the languageless to take my breast so we could be done and I could get back to the work which would not wait. I'm so relaxed, I don't remember how that son now tells me that seven was the worst year because that was the year I left to find a job 
how the time difference meant there were days we could not talk at all. I pack the picture books he has outgrown into cardboard boxes I label for some future hymn's nostalgic need for bears on quests, their orphaned hunts for hats and homes and sleep. My mother never saved such things. She thought I'd want to forget those years. Sometimes what has happened never stops happening. Even now, this windowed conference room smell of toner, the tea let out to stale, our old disappointments dandruff the air, a thought scrum of hurt. I am so relaxed though I can finally be kind. So I cradle my boss, sing him a lullaby until he burbles with joy. I could do anything to his soft body. From a distance, this looks like mercy. A freckled boy cradling the broken bird, his stones set loose from the sky. The woods outside applaud. They have been waiting for the man and me to come home. Another's blood the key, the violence of time the door. Um, and when that poem finally got accepted, it was, uh, it was by a really good journal and I was really excited, but then I realized I had to probably hide it. Um, so <laughs> I'm searching for my next one. So this next poem is, um, it was part of a series that I didn't really finish developing that sort of, uh, although I have a lot of work I have a lot of work that's interested in nostalgia without being nostalgic, um, thinking about like the violence of time and um, the dangers of nostalgia. But this is called Juvenilia. I am a child in the lunchroom, which is the sometimes gym, singing my known truths. I love milk. To which Tanya says, if you love it so much, why don't you marry it? And that's a fair point, Tanya. Why don't I marry this milk? Why don't I plan an elaborate ceremony, choose colors, invite Milk's family and Milk's college friends to stay near, but not with us? Why don't I start picking the poems now to be read as we wed somewhere necessarily refrigerated? Just like a child to think it's so easy that love is a one-way act or a matter of decision. We can't love what we love into loving us. Tanya, if I could, why would I waste my time with milk or with you, you whom I decidedly do not love? I'd be out charming my indifferent grandmothers into expressions of genuine affection and jewelry. I'd be deepening a correspondence with television and movie star Michael J. Fox, who I imagine chastely kissing with my full and future lips, making sounds I've seen on the screen. Tanya. This is the smallest torture you'll think up for me. Perfected until junior high starts and I am in honors classes and you are not. Forgive me, this my own small wounding, but I'm storing these cruelties inside me like a library dedicated to one kind of war. I am becoming a woman who'll do almost anything to be wanted. Why don't I marry the milk? Tanya, ask the milk what there is in me to love. Um, Tanya reached out to be my Facebook friend a few years ago. The audacity, Tanya. I said no. Um, one last poem. Thank you again so much. Um, I'm so excited to get to hear Rebecca read from this beautiful new book and to have a conversation with her. Thank you, everyone. This poem is called Civilization. You know that thing where you're someone's wife and you're out someplace with faces and suddenly you're shaking with the room's potential for kindness or cruelty while also finally understanding the tragedy of the dinner party, its reliance on food and talking and how they both have to happen with the same whole. And this is a joke 
both the truth and the awareness of the truth, and also humanness, how it happens just in one body for each of us. And there's no board to go to should you wish to dispute the results, the where and when of this you. So you leave to the bathroom when the flan is served, and there is someone else's wife already there, smoking a cigarette she found in the host's son's room. And when you put your lips to where your her lips have been and inhale sharply the tar, you know she is barely in her body too. The heat of disappointment doing the deep valley of her philtrum. So what can you do but press your sweatered chest together, letting her heart murmur to yours its own meaty I am's your twin drums announcing the coming war, the kind of war where you must shelter from yourself and someone else. So you lean in together, your Linnea Negras humming into the other, seeming you into one. And when you kiss each of her tears, you swallow the memory of their making, the quiet bed, the uterine collapse, the daughter whittled down to bone. And then her lips take you in, Black birds moving in the field like a churning night. And you know how, as this is happening, you make a choice. And how thinking gives it shape, a pearl your longing has made. You rolling it with your tongue against your expensed teeth. So that the choice becomes a secret. And when a husband knocks on the door to see how one of you are, you separate. Each wife holding in her mouth what she has seen, what she has chosen, and swallows. Thank you. That was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I love the like the humor in a lot of them that uh, that helps balance the like heavy topics. That's that's great. Um, I really appreciate you sharing those with us. Thank you, um, Nicole. Yeah, and the Michael J. Fox reference, also great. <laughs> um, Rebecca's book actually starts with uh, two quotes, one uh, by Terry Pratchett and one by Shakespeare. Um, so I was like, okay, I know I'm gonna like this because <laughs> of those. And so the Michael J. Fox also means that I will definitely like the book. Yay. Um, you can see this whole shelf is my Terry Pratchett shelf. Um, so I, I appreciated that uh, in the beginning of Rebecca's book, who, which I will now introduce and then she can read to you from that. So Rebecca Aronson is the author of Anchor, which just came out on uh, Thursday, uh, the 6th, from Horizon Books. And she also wrote Ghost Child of the Atalanta Bloom, which was the winner of the 2016 Horizon Books Poetry Prize and winner of the 2019 Margaret Randall Book Award from the Albuquerque Museum Foundation, and Creature Creature, which was the winner of the Maine Traveled Roads Poetry Prize in 2007. She has been a recipient of a Prairie Schooner Strauss Award and Loft's Speak Easy Poetry Prize and a Tennessee Williams Scholarship to Swanee. She is co-founder and host of Bad Mouth, um, a series of words and music, and she teaches writing in New Mexico. All right, Rebecca, your turn. All right, thank you. Um, first, thank you to my partner in poetry crime, Erin. Thank you for agreeing to read with me, and I'm so excited for this upcoming book. It's it's going to be fabulous. It is fabulous. Um, and I also want to thank Nicole and Kim for putting this all together and Anne, my sister-in-law, for suggesting this event. Hi, Anne. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to be reading from Anchor, a brand new book. Um, Anchor occurred, it sort of came out of um, several years ago, my, my father, who had not yet been diagnosed with anything, had started to fall fairly frequently. And eventually he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. Um, and over the course of his illness, which consisted of more and more frequent falls, I, I really started to think a lot about gravity, this thing that pulls us, pulls him to the ground, pulls all of us to the ground. And I did some very physics light kind of reading to understand um, to try and understand a little bit more what this force of gravity is. Um, so I, I read Seven Brief Lessons on Physics by C Carlo uh, Rovelli. Um, and 
there's not a lot of physics <laughs> made it into the book, but it did it did sort of help me think about what gravity is. And I also at the same time was kind of picturing gravity as a sort of um, a kind of capricious god uh, of a force that just like to mess with people um, as it he they she seemed to be messing with my father. So um, some of the the first poems I'm going to read. Um, from Anchor are these letters to gravity, Dear, they all begin Dear Gravity, and they're me addressing gravity directly. And there's about 10 of those, 10 of those threaded throughout the book. Um, and then I'm going to take a break from that and read a couple of um, poems that are more about um, health and youth, <laughs> um, and then and go back to the Dear Gravity poems to end. So, the first one. Dear Gravity, may I call you grave? An old tree falls after long weakening, after years of unseen hollowing, and it keeps falling, rotted core turning to damp dust, becoming earth, the body its own trench. At the doctor's office, the nurse says, I've grown shorter, only natural. I stare hard, but can't wipe the pleasant smile off her face. I am sinking, not quite like a ship or a deflating balloon, but like the house's foundation. I am the house and the clay it is built on and eventually the unrecognizable rune. My mother's hips are out of plumb. She lists like a sailboat about to slice sideways into waves and then under. My father's head is even with my own, so he's winning the shrinking race. Imagine us becoming not just shorter, but thinner, not lying down for the last time, but disappearing altogether like a popsicle that has melted into a stain on someone's smile. The second Dear Gravity poem. Dear Gravity, do you imagine he is trying to escape you? Jealous, you pull him close and closer, leave cement kisses on his appendages. His blood soaks through asphalt, through sidewalk paving, pools and car parks, trying to get to you. Already you are bonded. See, he loves you back. Only his bones, they might belong to air. It's not so much they strive for flight, but they dissolve, becoming mist, becoming cloud. His heavy brain unbalances him. I know, you are trying to make an anchor, having filled his legs with fluid until they nearly burst. Hear them sloshing. I think they have their own tides that tug and wash him to the ground, which embraces him the only way it knows, armless and inarticulate. It can only bruise. You want him all to yourself, but he is half floating, half falling. Yearn for his attention pull with such insistence he begins to split beloved toy you have adored to pieces i, I think one more dear gravity poem um before i move on to other other themes for a minute for a minute dear gravity at night i think about you just as i think about the moon how it pulls my body's rhythms into just I live by, but never asked for. You dislodge an old man from his center, my father, subverted. You and the moon metal and distort. I want to understand as if knowledge actually were actually power. Things fall because space curves. Space curves because of matter. The body's matter displaces space a little with every step. And so he falls, my father. His, his mind on the curve of pavement, carefully treading on matter's ghostly shadow. That's my poet's version of explaining, <laughs> explaining matter and gravity. Um, let's see. So this next one, which I've just suddenly lost in my book. Sorry about this. Um, this next one is... Um, this is a poem about a dress that I loved. 
and it's called The Dress I Loved. <laughs> um, sorry, I don't know why I can't find it. Eek. Worst poetry reading faux pas is to lose your poem. I am about to find it though. Okay. Forgive me. The dress I loved. The dress I loved had a ribboned hem and vertical stripes where the light flowed through. Wearing it, I was a grove of shadowed birch, a waterfall's scattered refraction, a vine growing out of the hard wall of a mesa. Explorers asking the way to the city of gold casino believed I was pointing them in the right direction. At parties, the dress became guardian of the names of secret lovers and unsayable desires. When I walked the dress to work, the sidewalk sidled alongside, bumping my leg like a needful dog. If I allowed a hand to follow the long spine of the zipper, my shoulders slid like lake stones, blades blurring as if rain, as if a forest turning night. The dress was never tight, no matter how many particles I swallowed. When I wore it, my face became like the memory of a face, unfixed, but probably smiling. The dress was a year of seconds, a hill made of spears of grass that slight breezes kept undoing. The dress was a wish I made as a child, the one my tongue held long after the ripples around the splash subsided. Um, this next poem is back from going back to my to my old waitressing days long ago. Um, and the place I worked for the longest had a jukebox that had some good songs, but a lot of songs that I just became so tired of and I couldn't stand. And I discovered that if I bumped the jukebox hard enough when I was walking past it, I could um, I could make the song skip and then eventually they'd come take the song out of the jukebox when it skipped enough. So there was certain songs that I did that too regularly. Um, um, and this one, Is That All There Is by Peggy Lee is one that I especially loathed and that I would try and scratch every time I walked by that jukebox. So this is, Is That All There Is. I used to hip check the jukebox when I passed it if I didn't like the song playing. The music would veer and skip where my curve met the rounded corners of neon and metal. I took out Peggy Lee's guttural wine this way every month until they finally stopped replacing it. I looked good in my stain-hiding brown waitress uniform, shined up with kitchen heat and magnetic. I wanted to dance because dancing made a flame lick at the edges of everything. Here was the secret to living. What is dull can be polished to a hot glow with the right friction. What is lost can be added to the heart's altar. Peggy Lee wailed her faith in disappointment, but she was wrong. Even the fryer grease that hung in the air and followed me from work to the bar once made a hungry boy tell me I smelled miraculous. Um, and while we're still in the world of my youth, um, this is a, a poem, um, I don't know if this is a poem about me or about my mother or about our relationship, but it's called My Mother Disapproves. My mother disapproves of afternoon languor, lying on couches, textured wallpaper, hammocks, guest rooms in which the fold-out bed is left unfolded, Curtains left closed past eight or open past dark. Matinees, drive-ins, daytime television, snacking, sweet cocktails, state fairs, corn dogs, hot dogs, dogs, any talk of God. Dive bars, motorcycles, mini skirts, pleather, cartoons, line dancing, most music composed past the 18th century, day drinking, playing hooky, ganja and boy bands, camping, car trips, RVs, Christmas lights, orange soda, messy rooms, spell check, tube tops, arrows drawn through a heart or shot at a bullseye, drama, melodrama, melancholy, 
snakes, cigarettes, green cars, mistletoe, skinny dipping, a smoky eye, tight pants, my uncombed hair, the fleshy unbound hours of my every day and night. All right. Um, I am going to read two more Dear Gravity poems. I'm going back to going back to the letters to gravity and stepping out of youth. <laughs> Dear Gravity, I know your voice. It is volcano deep, a rumble like a rhythm that is felt but not heard. Still, it drops me. Wherever I am, I feel you speaking through the gum stuck walk or the flame orange hedge or in my tear ducts, which let down their water unbidden. What could be less convenient? I'm always crying in the naked sunshine. I blame you for reminding me every hour to look down to where loss is kept. The scattered leaves and underneath a bird's wing partitioned into smooth gray fingers. My own hands swell and shrink with the weather. How vexing to be made an instrument that measures only what can't be mastered. I miss skipping, though I could still do it. I miss that I could skip and feel the kind of alive that made me dizzy, so I would have to fling myself on the grass with my head thrown back, the hum I felt there, a song I can almost recall the lyrics to. All right, um, the last poem I'm gonna read, it's, um, it's a longer Dear Gravity poem. I'm pretty sure that this is the first the first letter to gravity that I wrote. Um, and this was near the, you know, in the last last weeks of my dad's life. Um, and I was in a hospital room late at night, everyone else was gone. And I was just sitting in a chair while my dad um, slept fitfully. And I, I, was, I was afraid to leave. Um, I wanted to be there and I just started writing in a notebook and this is this is the poem that came from that so this is the first letter to gravity Dear Gravity My father in his bed is a wrinkle among thin blankets his breath an engine turning over his arms go up sometimes in his ungentle sleep, as if to protect the eggshell of his skull, as if he is hiding under the desk of the world and the sirens have begun to blare. Dear gravity, I cannot say he doesn't float despite this heaviness. He drifts in a half sleep, speaks in a half tongue, such dreaming only the dying can do. The meat he asks back to his bare bones won't come from soup or cups of pudding cajoled into the red gap of his open mouth, which has gone loose as a broken hinge. One, one, one more only, this the very last, the nurse says, spoon tilted, her own hips straight and solid, someone so planted in the world it would take a violence to uproot her. My father, both sinks and soars in his dry, thin paper skin. His lips are red and dark, despite their roughed up skin. Despite such poverty of moisture, they demark the entrance to the watery cave of the body. The lexicon of questions is poor in relation to that vast tunnel, the red and slightly pulsing tunnel beyond the ivory markers of his rotted porcelain teeth. Where in that dis disintegrating labyrinth is the him that is? Not the lights that flash and blink on the body's dashboard, not the automatic systems that stutter along until they don't, not even the voice that sometimes booms out orders, surprising the muddle of confounded mutters, the litany of small refusals whispered hoarsely in the direction of the lamp's plastic wrapped shade. What is left, gravity? after the body has been turned to ashes and after his imprint and stink have been replaced by someone else's and after even the words have been spoken among friends and family and the catered panini cleared finally away. After the urn has been placed on a mantle, 
Where will he be? Not anywhere anyone's hand can reach for his own, which rests yet on the blanket and through which runs a live blue vein like a mountain range at dusk seen from very far above. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad I'd already read those poems because that one uh, made me cry the first time. So I, I'm not, I'm good now. <laughs> um, so yeah, that one, uh, your poems are very touching and very relatable. Um, so now we're moving on to the um, chat part or the conversation part um, about crafts, about the poems they read. Um, so if anybody has any questions or comments, now is the time. And um, and then the two of you, if you have any questions for each other or or aspects of your poetry that you'd like to, to talk about, um, okay. <laughs> well, I want to start by um, asking Rebecca some questions. Um, and I'm, I'm familiar with some of these in much earlier versions, like when the, the Dear Gravity poem started. And so I was... And I, you know, I, I kind of know a little bit of this, but I'm curious to hear you talk about the choice of like an epistolary form of why a letter, right, to explore some of this. And then also it's interesting because, you know, I think part of the epistolary form is there's almost like the form expects an answer. Um, and so what is the answer? I don't know. I'm <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> Yeah, gravity never wrote back. I'm rude. So <laughs> I know, except except for to keep on, you right. know, keep on shoving people to the ground. Um, I don't really know why why they came out as letters. Um, that the first one, the most, the one that I read last. Um, I that's just kind of what I scribbled in my notebook, and I think it was because. Um, even prior to that letter, I had been sort of reading about gravity and thinking about gravity. And I had begun to picture gravity, you know, like I said, as sort of a capricious God. So I was thinking of gravity as a character um, already. And so it seemed, it made sense to me to write to that character that, that gravity was no longer just this, no longer a force, but had become you know, personified or animated in a in a way that was really present for me while I wrote those poems. Um, I tried after I after I had written, I think about twelve of these poems, um, ten of which made it in some form into the book. I felt like there was a little bit of a gap, and I tried again to write another Dear Gravity poem, and I discovered that 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 was that was done. Like the correspondence was over. <laughs> Um, well, and it's interesting, too, because I think that, you know, rather than because like so many things happen to the people we love and as our parents age. Right. And so you're you're taking it and you're making it almost like a more, myth, you know, like the sort of mythological level. Right. It's not just like something's happening to your father. It's in a battle with something that has an agenda. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think especially pre-diagnosis, it kind of that felt real to me in a way. I really I really, nobody really knew what was going on, or at least I, I didn't, and he didn't seem to. And so it, it really did feel like a kind of a, a battle against this unknown and this unknown bully <laughs> of sorts. Um, and then kind of once that was fixed in my head, that's, it just stayed, stayed that way. Um, and I, in some ways, I think that he saw it that way as well. Yeah, there was there was something that was an enemy outside of outside of him that he had to deal with. Yeah. So, yeah. But I, I also think um, I also think that for me, it was a way of processing what was happening and processing grief and processing my own my own mortality and my own and and my own parenting and all those things. So the letters became a way to sort of step back a little bit from what was just just happening to me and 
think of it in in terms outside of myself a bit, which was really helpful. I wonder, I actually kind of have a similar question for you, Erin. I wonder if that using mythology or fairy tales or, mm-hmm. you know, in this case, the furies, if that was a way, if you came to that sort of, um, if that was a choice you made on purpose or if it kind of came, I mean, obviously it was intentional, but if you came to that sort of accidentally, um, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's kind of interesting is that I was, I don't know, it might've been 2017. I think my book had just come out or, or 2018, like, you know, it was, it was, um, it was like 2018 anyway, maybe about a year. And so I was writing new poems, but I just didn't know, I didn't know where they w- were going I didn't know what they were doing. And I think at some point I was like, I, I, I think might've even said out loud, like I'm bored of my own voice. I'm bored of, what I have to, you know, I was like, so I wrote this poem and I didn't have a specific, it wasn't a persona, but it was not my voice. And I was like, what if, you know, this voice did this and this could say this and have this power and I didn't have a character for it. And so I did this kind of, I was like, maybe this would work better with a sort of assigned persona voice rather than people just thinking I've like lost. Cause it's this like wrath, hell thing, do you know? And like, she, well, she's having some feelings. Um, and then I did, I was like, I was just playing with my name, Aaron, which is, a, you know, the Aaronies is another word for furies. And then I kind of had some like flash moments of like, and I went to the Oristea. So it really came out of play, um, just play with voice, which I think is where a lot of my, so I, if I have had all these great intentions, like, oh, I'll take this work and I'll do, I'll do like a, you know, conversation. And it just like never works. It just feels like I'm trying too hard. And so um, I just kind of have to play around and and let things in as they want to come in. Like you were saying with your research about physics, right? Like you read all that stuff and most of it doesn't like make it on the page, but it informs our lens, right? Our language choices. Um, yeah. So that's why I think it was just a boredom. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I think play is a good a good reason to write poetry. Um, we do have an audience question. So Bryn Gribben says, this is not the first book for either of you. So I'm curious about what you find with the new books regarding freedom in form or freedom periods. What do you find yourself letting go of or returning to in these new books? I think Rebecca's epistolary mode is a coping mechanism, a power that she thinks she can reach out to. And then it's continued in more comments. Uh, so what is it that you find yourself looking towards in later work? My first book is a diary, many say, but I could see I was moving toward weirder things later or maybe mm-hmm. find obligation to something odd rather than freedom. Mm-hmm. So um, your first books versus these books and the like themes going through them in form. Hmm. It's a big yeah, question. I mean, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a big question. It's a lot to answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, in general, I don't know if this is exactly going to answer it, Bryn. Um, but in general, I don't, I don't think in books. I, I know, I know some poets who do. Who they, they plan out projects, and you know, kind of like Aaron was saying, like I, I had this, in, I had this vision. I was going to do this research. I was going to write this, and it just comes to nothing. And that, that's how it goes for me too. I basically write just poems, and so when I when I was writing the Dear Gravity poems and I realized that they were a sequence, I I was almost afraid to think like, oh, this could be a book um, because I didn't kind of want to, I didn't want to jinx it for myself. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, but for the, for the most part, I'm just, I'm just writing, just writing individual poems. And then later after I, you know, say, say when I have 40 or so, then I can start to see how, how things might connect. Yeah. And I think and Rebecca and I've had this conversation a million times about sort of like the idea of being a project poet, um, which, you know, labels, whatever. I don't think they're, they're helpful only until they're not helpful, but um, neither of us is particularly drawn to that method of composition. But for my second, so the first book is very much, even though it was like 41 when it came out, it was very much like a first book of like poems I wrote, you know, um, which I love those books, actually. I, I'm still a huge fan. Um, but I did feel this pressure. And I think perhaps it was just artificial. Perhaps I I was seeing something out there. But I was like, this has to be like really cohesive and really designed and really intentional. And that actually just like, <laughs> kind of like, 
put a lot of like it dampened um, the way I work. And so the working title for this was actually hysterical. And um, and then uh, Lisa Bassett, who's a um, writer with The Rumpus, uh, I saw that her book was coming out called Hysterical. I'm like, well, OK, I have to. So not only was I like, I have to retitle it. Um, and she's been kind enough to like support my work in there. So I was like, but then it gave me the opportunity to like re-see that project. So I was trying to do a lot of research on like hysteria and, you know, like the wandering womb, all of which is really interesting, but I was just trying too hard. Um, and so I think what happened in the second book was I leaned into the things I love to do, which is play, but I have a lot more voices. And I, I think I didn't realize until going back how, how many personas there are in the book, which was not intentional. I didn't sit down, but I think it was just wanting to play and wanting to discover. And so for me, that's what process is. That's what writing is. I, I write not to present what I know, but to achieve, like work my way to knowledge or understanding. Um, and so a lot of that is just filled drafts and you're reading things that you think are going to go into a poem and don't. Um, but I did feel, you know, I think writing the, like, is am I right, Rebecca? Like writing the new poems for the next book is, it's so hard. Like the first poems for a new book. Yeah. I mean, I think especially if, if you have, like I also did this sort of sense of expectation about, I feel like there was maybe, and maybe it's still going on, I, I don't know, but I feel like there was really a trend towards these very coherent project books um, that, yeah, I also felt sort of like that's what I should be doing. And I, mm -hmm. I, I can't, you know, my brain doesn't work that way. But I mean, to, to echo back to something Bryn said in her comment about moving towards weirder things later, I feel like that that is the impulse. Like I, I also can get pretty bored of my own voice pretty easily. And so thinking, moving towards weirder things is kind of the goal, like to get out of my own voice a little bit and, mm -hmm. um, and to try on different personas and to, to think from not just my own experience, but outside perspectives and just try and get out of, you know, get out of that labyrinth of self a little bit. I, you know, I definitely didn't get out of the labyrinth of self in Anchor, but I'm kind of hoping, yeah. hoping for future projects to do that. Well, and it's interesting because you say like that labyrinth of self, because one of the things I was thinking about, and I wrote a note when you were reading, such a nerd, I'm like, let me re review my poetry notes, was this idea of like, where, where is there room for self in caretaking, especially that sort of sandwich generation, multi-generational caretaking that you've written about, that you've lived through that same here, like, where is there room for the self? And so there's this interesting thing is like, you're making room for the self in the poems, but at the same time, I think, you know, maybe we're, we're like, we're like, well, excusing that instead of like, I think that's a, a really important act of like, you know, reclamation and ownership is to like identify like that self, like yourself, the, the writer self amidst all of these events. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you guys, you were talking about, um, about writing the poems individually and not writing them as a set, but when you put them into the collection, like I think there's a lot of work done to, to make it read cohesively. Um, so even if like you aren't writing them with cohesion in mind, like it, it works. Um, like one of the things the the mother uh, just my mother disapproves that poem well um, because of like it's maybe halfway through the book um, and so then when I was reading after that I kept like every time there was anything that was on that list I was like oh the mother would disapprove the mother would disapprove the mother would disapprove um, so like the, everything ties together in ways um, that I think really works really well even um, even if you didn't intend it when you were writing when you place them in the book it, it adds more layers you know um what was since you weren't writing them to be cohesive when you were putting the collection together uh, what, what sort of things were you thinking about yeah i mean that's one of for me i think that's both really the, i think it's really hard to to order a manuscript and mm -hmm. you know aaron and i have been through that together <laughs> pretty intensively um, with, with our previous books. Um, 
it's really hard to do. And often I feel like I'm too close to the poems to see potential arcs. But, um, but for, certainly with Ghost Child, I, I really, I really needed Aaron and, uh, you know, other outside eyes to help me see how things might fit together. With Anchor, um, I did have outside help. Definitely my friend um, Nancy Meyer helped me a lot in ordering and lots of other things as well. But, um, but I also, as when I looked at all the poems together, when I printed them out and, you know, strewed them all over the floor, I could see links that I hadn't been aware of when I was writing them. And I think because I wrote them over a shorter period of time, just a couple of years, I guess, three years, as opposed to like, I don't know, the hundred years that the <laughs> ghost child took me. Um, so they were, they all felt a little bit more, um, the voice felt a little bit more coherent and the themes, there's a lot of sort of similar themes threaded throughout those poems. And so, though I still had a pretty hard time thinking about the order, the sort of narrative arc, because changing the order changes that story a lot or changes sort of the, I don't know, the mood of the story. But um, but I had a much easier time seeing possible ways that they could fit together because it was it was a more condensed time. But how about you, Erin? How was how was putting together this? Most I, it also took forever. Um, I actually the first I think I wrote the first set of poems much more quickly because I did write them almost like in a fever. This very like postpartum depression, um, and I hadn't written. I hadn't written poems in years and years and years. I got an MFA and was like, well, that's the end of that. Um, like, thanks for nothing, everyone. <laughs> I got them, you know, it was like, uh, poetry and I broke up. And so when I came back to it, I was actually in a writing group with Rebecca um, and there was a lot of encouragement and they were part of the group um, that was like, you need to send your work out. And then I went and had a panic attack in Lisa and Gary Jackson's bathroom. Um, <laughs> but then I finally did it and I think it, that one went fairly quickly because it was like years and years and years and years of like tightly condensed stuff. And then it came out. Um, and this this one was, it was a much slower process. I also had like several different jobs. I kept moving around to sort of, in theory, moving up my career ladder. Um, but I think that's part of it, right? I think I do think that like the books are there. I mean, I am seeing them as like kind of like stages in, in life, right? Um, and that the second one is more explicitly about some of the exhaustedness that comes from like all the multi, you know, multiple caretaking roles. Um, in terms of ordering it, I use, I, it's loosely ordered as like the Oresteia. So it's like Agamemnon, um, the second the libation bearers, right? And then the Eumenides and you know, it's like Agamemnon sacrifices of Virginia, it's the Trojan War, and Clytemnestra's wife's like, oh, hi, welcome back. You killed our daughter, um, and you brought a girlfriend. How cool for us. Um, <laughs> and she, like, murders him, and then their son's like, I can't believe you murdered dad, and then he murders his mom. And, like, also, no one's, like, crying for Iphigenia, whatever. Um, so, but I, I use this sort of, like, that arc, but instead of having it sort of resolve as, like, you know, Athena says, be cool, everyone, and forgive, because, like, um, cause it wasn't about forgiveness. It was just like, it was, it was something else. And there's a line that Athena has. It was like, well, I didn't have a father. So yeah, I didn't have a mother. I didn't have a mother. So I clearly think a child is more her father's than her mother's in terms of like, um, Clytemnestra's grief. So I just kind of tried to pattern it that way. And it really, it meant that some poems I, I liked didn't make it in cause they didn't make it into those arcs and the particular story that was emerging. And I think that is what a difficult thing is to listen, be able to like listen to your, and have people in your life, hopefully, unfortunately, who help you, help you to see that. Um, but a funny story about Rebecca and I putting our last books together is we were like, we both had small houses and kid, like young kids were like, where are we supposed to do this? Cause you need to like lay it out on the ground. So I put out a Facebook call and my very nice friend from camp when I was a kid, I was like, oh, I have a cabin in Southern Colorado, my family cabin. It's not very, you know, it's not super nice, but you can go. We're like, oh, it'll be great. And it was, it's 
I don't think rustic was the right word, right? <laughs> like, there's so many dead fly strips. Um, it was really funny because we were like, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, we, we think poetry and it's like, you know, uh, so erudite, but really it got like, it was a dirty business. <laughs> Literally, yeah. <laughs> but very grateful, very, very grateful, yeah. Um, one of the things I was thinking about during Aaron's uh, reading, when I also took some poetry notes, um, <laughs> I think that's a just a poetry nerd thing. Everybody does that, right? Love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm was when you were talking about how when you wrote the poem about work so you had to hide it um mm -hmm. i was thinking about like rebecca writing about her family um the layers of like writing something that's personal and then wanting it to be seen but not wanting it to be seen mm -hmm. uh, or like showing things but trying not to show too much uh do you guys have have commentary on on that difficulty Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it's, you know, I was, I was, I was writing about my ailing parents, not that there aren't other people in my poems, but I was writing about my ailing parents um, who probably wouldn't have wanted to see themselves as ailing parents, um, but also they had always been they'd always actually been really supportive of my writing. So I didn't, I didn't have any fear um, about them ever seeing these poems. Um, I certainly have written poems that I opted not to, to publish or not to include in a book because they, I was, I was worried about how they might be taken by people who, and in fact, in my first book, uh, somebody in Creature Creature, I remember somebody accusing me of having written a poem about them and being pretty insulted by it when in fact, it, it had it actually had nothing to do with them. So I was, I was like, ah, you know, people. Like it's, a, it's a real Carly Simon moment. Yes, right, right. This poem is not about you. <laughs> and that you think this poem is about you. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But Aaron, so how did you ultimately, uh, with, the, with the boss poem, did you? Well, just... I left that job. Like I said, I left that profession actually. Yeah. And um, the person, who inspired it uh, was not a poet. And so I was like, well, let's just, and I think that was part of it is, you know, you're a poet as a poet at a small regional university and no one really cares. And so in some way that's the source of tension, but that's also the, the freedom. Um, and I'm here visiting family and God bless them. Not one of them was like, ooh, how can we watch? You know, <laughs> we, we ate our catfish at dinner at Humphrey Pete's, shout out, early Texas. Um, and they're like, well, have fun at the thing. And that's what they called it, the thing. Um, and that's fine. You know, we didn't, we didn't, we're not a poetry family. Um, so I write for different reasons. Um, and it, it does give me a little bit of freedom, but also, but I do feel, you know, responsible. I don't want to um, mis misrepresent. And so I always say that, you know, what I write is, is highly fictionalized. It's either fictionalized real stuff or just stuff I make up, honestly. I don't think that any of these books should be read as sort of like, like, yeah, people are like, oh my God, I can't believe you went through that. I was like, are you talking about the dragons? That's not real. Um, Michael J. Fox was real. I loved him in middle school and everyone else my age loved Kirk Cameron. And I think we all know who made the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you win. <laughs> yeah. And I love him. And if he's watching, hi. <laughs> I'm sure he is. I'm, I'm sure, sure he is. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point that that even though I mean, anchor more than anything else I've written is is very much about things that I was going through, but it is, you know, run through the filter of, of imagination and, and, you know, nonsense. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, for sure, it's not I'm not trying to write my autobiography, my memoirs or anything. And I, and I, sometimes when people ask me questions about, about my life based on the poems, I'm like, well, well that's not exactly, right. not exactly true. It's not, not true, but it's also not true. You know? Yeah. 
Yeah. It's a pleasure. I, it's a, yeah, it's, it is, our, it is my way to truth yeah. rather than again, a presentation of truth. It's my way to, to understanding a, a truth. Um, and, and I, and for me, like, yeah, I was like in the boss poem, like I turn him into a baby, like that's not happen. Um, mostly, but, um, but I, you know, I think, it, you know, that imagination that Rebecca is talking about is so important for me. And again, I think that's a, a sort of way to have, we're, if we're both writing about situations in which we have a lack of control, right? Because of things happening to people we love or we're experiencing um, different kinds of abuse or marginalization or whatever it is. And in the poem, we we have that control or control to, to some extent. And I, I love that in Rebecca's, like Rebecca's work is so lush, but it's also, I, I feel like it's really marked by restraint and um, and precision. And I, and I think that that's so fascinating because it's writing about like a, a complete lack of control, right? Uh, falling is something that happens to you. Um, and so it, it employs control in order to explore what happens to the loss of that. And I love that. Well, speaking of the lack of control, I want to apologize for my dogs tonight. Uh, but I'm random things to eat, which is why I was running away to like get things out of his mouth. Um, but um, we're getting ready to wrap up. <laughs> so I did want to ask one last question, uh, which is, what are you guys reading now, or what would you recommend that we read? Uh, so, like, if people really love your poetry books, uh, what what should they read next? <laughs> um, so I'm reading. Well, I'm always reading multiple things and I always kind of have a couple of novels going. Um, even though during the semester of teaching, I'm, I barely have time to read, but, but I, I got, I've got three books that I'm really, really delighting in right now. Um, one of them is, um, Annie Woodford's Where You Come From is Gone. She's an Appalachian writer. And it's just, I mean, it's such a beautiful book. It's really, um, the, it's just the music in it is gorgeous. And it's, you know, it, it grapples with, it grapples with difficult things growing up in Appalachia, but it's, it's just done with such, amazing voice and gorgeousness. And I, I absolutely love it. The poems are multi-layered and beautiful. And at the same time, I'm reading Kathy Fagan's brand new book, Bad Hobby, which is blowing my mind. I just started it and I'm finding that like, I can only read one poem at a time. And then I'm kind of I'm kind of like slayed for a while and I just have to sit with that one poem and then come back to it. It's, it's almost like too rich to read all at once, but it's super compelling. And it's, it grapples with a lot of the same stuff that anchor does actually um, one parent dying, one parent with dementia, um, but in really different ways. And she's just a magician with language. It's a stunning, stunning, stunning book. And then the last one I'm going to make a pitch for is Amy Beter, who's a, a fellow New Mexican poet. Um, her third book, mm -hmm. So Wax, was made and also oh, another book. Um, it's really great. It's the, the, she uses this like Baroque, I don't know, Elizabeth, Elizabethan maybe language throughout. The language is just, um, is, is, I don't know. Yeah, it's Baroque. It's it's really fascinating. And the poems are gorgeous and um and it's very funny, um, but also but also, you know, really, really deep. And I I love it. So those are my pitches. How about you, Hodges? What was the name, what was the name of the third one? Sorry, I ran away because that's oh it's um and so wax was made and also honey. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'll look into that. Sorry, Aaron. Well, I'm actually using the book um, that for a stand to put my computer on. Um, so it's a novel, uh, Ruth Ozeki is a Tale for the Time Being. Um, I have to admit, I'm a bad poet right now, um, I have not written or read a lot of poetry recently. Um, in January, I did become a, a fiction acquisitions editor, and I absolutely love this job, but I'm, I'm immersing pretty deep in fiction. 
but when I'm reading for pleasure, I am reading like sort of highly lyrical work such as Ezeki's. Um, and I think, you know, as a way to keep in the poetry world and, and, and once I maybe figure out my, my workload in my life, I'll be able to get back a little bit into verse, but I think that just happened. Um, you know, we gotta, we gotta be flexible and, and, and read, read what fulfills us. Okay. Yeah. Else? Thanks, Max. Whatever you're reading is input, you know, and then you, you can do it output in your poetry. So it doesn't have to be poetry that works with the input, you know, it can be science books. Exactly. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the recommendations. And again, if anybody wants uh, copies of Anchor, they are currently available at our store. And Aaron's book is available for pre-order. Um, I don't know that we have any virtual events lined up anytime soon, but we have regular author events at the store. So people should come by and check us out. We're in Swanee, Georgia. And we have a whole bunch of poetry um, author interviews that we did in 2020 where we interviewed two poets like every week uh, for like 10 months. So those are all on our YouTube page if anybody wants to check out the backlog. But thank you everyone for tuning in and uh, have a great rest of your night. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone.